Um, the next speaker is uh, Jim Gatherall, again, somebody who I don't have to introduce. Um, just very quick introduction. Uh, he's the author of the best-selling book, The Volatility Surface, spent 17 years at uh, Merrill Lynch, heading the equity uh, quantitative analytics group, then switched to um, 2010, switched to the financial engineering program at Baruch, where he became presidential professor in 2013. And actually the first time I met Jim was 2014, where, when he first presented his work uh, on rough volatility. It was very exciting. And uh, he presented it with such an enthusiasm that it was clear that something interesting is about to happen. Today, he will not be speaking about rough volatility uh, per se, but he will be speaking about something that he presented uh, 2018 in the Rio workshop, but the simplified version of that. And we always know that something simple is uh, quite difficult to do, whereas presenting something more complicated way is, uh, is easy. So we are in for a treat. And what he will be speaking about goes much in the direction of this festive season that we're coming to uh, enjoy um, with colorful trees and forex expansions, but this time maybe in the sense of uh, Thayman and Martin Hyrer. So I'm very, very well happy to welcome Jim Gatherall. The floor is yours. Uh, well, thank you, Blanca, for that very long and wonderful introduction. <laughs> I feel very strange uh, speaking to a blank wall here but that's in the nature of the current uh, pandemic. I need to start by saying happy birthday, albeit very, very belated to Marco. Feliz Aniversario, aniversario Marco. And uh, yeah, let's, let's hope we have many opportunities to see each other in Rio in the future. Okay, so here's a brief outline of my talk. First of all, I'll define the diamond product, which you should be familiar with from two years ago, but maybe not given that those two years has passed. And then I'll present the G expansion, which is like the father of the K expansion and the F expansion. Well, F stands for forest, and that was the original expansion that I presented two years ago. K expansion, is actually just a reordering of that expansion, it turns out. But it turns out that, well, K stands for cumulant, so it's German for cumulant expansion. And it turns out that this is precisely the cumulant expansion. So basically we see, going backwards, that the F expansion is just a reordering of the cumulant expansion. And as I said, the G expansion is the parent of each of these in a kind of pretty way that I will show. So then we'll apply this to stochastic volatility. And of course, rough volatility does enter this talk, as you would expect. And we'll do some explicit computations in affine forward variance models. And in particular, one of my, the favorite affine forward variance model is, of course, the rough Heston model. So just to remind you, last time I spoke at, at Rio, which was 2018, I presented the diamond product and the exponentiation theorem. Um, the proof was kind of like magic. Now you might think that magic is a good thing because it's kind of like Erdosh, you know, like proof from the book, it comes from heaven. However, now that I see the proof that actually Peter Fritz came up with, this is definitely the proof from Erdosh's book as you will see in a second. So we'll explain the remarkably simple origin of the forest expansion. We'll give its convergence properties, which follow simply from the fact that it's a reordering of the, of the cumulant expansion and the convergence properties of that thing are very well known. And we'll attempt to give a sense of the wide applicability of this thing. Well, let's start with definition of the diamond product. Given two continuous semi-martingales, not martingales, but semi-martingales, A and B, with an integrable covariation process. The diamond product of A and B is another continuous semi-martingale. This is important because this is allow allows this to change them together. So A diamond B is just 
the conditional expectation of the quadratic covariation of A and B. So what are its properties? Well, it's commutative. A diamond B is equal to B diamond A. It's non-associative, so everything depends on where you put the brackets. A diamond B depends only on the respective martingale parts of A and B. Well, this is often extremely convenient for computation because you just throw out all the drift parts in your calculations. You're only concerned with the martingale parts. And it's important to note that A diamond B is in general a semi-martingale and it's not in general a martingale. So here is theorem 1.1 from uh, our recent paper, let y be a real valued random variable with an associated uh, martingale, which is just the conditional expectation of y, under natural integra integrability conditions with a b small enough, with this expansion here converges. So basically this thing is giving you an expression for the moment generating function or the characteristic function, depending on your point of view. For me as a physicist, they're the same thing, but Peter Fritz keeps trying to educate me that they're not the same, okay. But anyway, this is the expansion, and you see the first order term, as you would expect, a uh, y val valued at the current time, little t, and b times quadratic variation of y, evaluated at the current time, plus a bunch of correction terms. And the whole idea is, a formula for computing all of these correction terms. So we see that G2 is this thing, given in terms of Y diamond Y, and, oh, sorry, and G of K is got from the lower order terms. So for example, G of three, well, this one would give you a Y diamond G of uh, two. Uh, is that correct? Yes, I think so. And so you can see that G of 3 is going to be something like Y diamond Y diamond Y with some coefficient. So how does this thing get, pro get proved? And uh, the proof is so simple that I think I'm going to be able to convince you that you could me memorize this proof. You could definitely give it to undergraduates. So let's define lambda to be the log of the conditional expectation of the exponential of some continuous semi-martingale. Then, by definition, just turning this round, uh, the conditional expectation of e to the z of t is e to the z of t plus lambda, this correction term. Well, you see immediately that if, uh, if we have an exponential martingale, then there's no cor correction term. This connect correction term would be zero. So you can think of this as being the correction term that turns the left-hand side into an exponential martingale in the sense that, by definition, lambda of capital T and, or lambda sub T, sub T, is exactly zero, right? So I take the left-hand side, I get e to the z T, and the right-hand side, e to the z, little t, plus correction. Okay, now, a noting we can, manip we can manipulate this expression here, and what we get is the following, what Peter Fritz calls a abstract Riccati equation, and you'll see why later, probably, or at least if you read the paper, you'll see why. So we get that lambda, Follow, uh, obeys the following recursion. First of all, this is the initial term in the expansion, and then everything is written in terms of diamond products of lower order terms in the expansion. So let's put some bones on this story. Now we put z equal to epsilon times a of y plus epsilon squared times b of quadratic variation of y, Remember, quadratic variation of y is basically kind of like y diamond y, so it makes sense to multiply this by epsilon squared. And so this is our expression for just plugging that into this equation here. We get this expression for lambda. You can see the recurrence 
occurring here. So we put lambda t equal to this and match coefficients of epsilon to the n. Then we get g2 is equal to b y diamond y plus a half a squared y diamond y. Where does that come from? Well, b times y diamond y plus a half epsilon squared y diamond y. Okay, it's going well enough. As I mentioned earlier, G3 is just going to be AY diamond G2. So I've got G2 computed. And G so we see re the recursion rapidly emerging. And the so this is the proof. Uh, it's very simple. And it's kind of amazing to us, having seen how simple the proof is, that this doesn't have a, appear to have been written down before. Well, except it was written down by us in some form in 2017, and then it was written again in 2019 by some guys doing quantum field theory, uh, so in a completely different context. So there are some interesting special cases. The first one is trivial, but very informative. Uh, so if I go back to the original expression here, and suppose I put b is equal to minus a half a squared, then I see I get the exponential martingale. And all the correction terms should vanish, as they certainly do, because if I put b equal to minus a half a squared, g2 vanishes, and therefore all the subsequent gk's vanish. So you can see that really this lambda is just a, the correction term that's required to make my moment generating function into kind of like expectation of uh, an exponential martingale. Now, our original F forest expansion comes from setting B is equal to not minus a half A squared, but minus a half A, uh, important, no square there. And this gives a general expression for the characteristic function of the log stock price in the stochastic volatility model written in forward variance form. But uh, this expansion, as you will see, respects the total probability condition and the martingale condition at each step in the expansion. So each tree satisfies these conditions. And finally, the cumulant expansion of Lacroix, Rhodes, and Vargas that came from uh, physics comes from setting b is equal b equal to zero. Uh, we give a number of other applications, including I think a neat. I'm not sure it's the neatest. Somebody in the chat room is probably going to write a comment here when I say possibly the neatest, but it's a very neat derivation of the moment generating function of the Levy area. And other applications likely include uh, computation of likelihood functions in statistics, computation of correlation functions in statistical physics, computation of am amplitudes in quantum theory. And you know it's just very satisfying to see in the end that problems in quantitative finance and quantum physics and elsewhere probably lead to the same nice mathematics. So now the general term in that equation two, which I can probably quick black to in this equation here, this general term, you can see nat naturally represented by binary trees, where the nodes in the tree are basically the diamond operation. Hence the, term hence the terminology G forest expansion. And when we wrote the exponentiation paper back in 2017, we said we use the language of trees and forests, but we never wrote them down. So here, finally, we write them down because it's going to be useful for the presentation, if nothing else. And I'd like to note that these trees were, in fact, stolen from Martin Hyrus. Oh, I, sorry, I screwed up here. They were stolen from Martin Hyrus because they are the same trees that uh, appear in his amazing proof are his his amazing um, Fields Medal winning work on the KPZ equation. So writing uh, this green dot as a shorthand for Y, in other words, a leaf on a tree, we have G2 is equal to this, G3 is equal to that, G4 is equal to this, and so on and so forth. And you know, it's really easy to see 
graphically how everything works. Now, what about the K-forest expansion? Remember, the K-forest expansion comes from setting B is equal to B equal to zero in the G-forest expansion. So I just set B equal to zero everywhere here. So that's pretty straightforward. And what do I get? Well, this is what I get. Okay. And th that, that corresponds to the following recursion. It's exactly the same as the G recursion, but with B, B set to zero. But we notice now that these Ks are just the cumulants up to a factor of n factorial. So since these Ks are just the cumulants, we know immediately what the convergence properties of this, this thing are, of this expansion of ours are. Now, why is it useful? to write uh, cumulants in this form? Why is it interesting to have cumulants as a recursion using the diamond, diamond product? Well, for example, from the forest expansion, we have that K3, the third cumulant, is given by Y diamond, Y diamond, Y. And in many instances, for example, the instances I will present towards the end of the a talk, these things are rather easy to compute. Or if they're not easy to compute, they're easy to approximate. And at the very least, they're easy to write down. On the other hand, a, and we know, of course, because it's in our culture, that a, the third cumulant is one over three factorial times the third central moment. Now, it's not at all obvious how to prove that this is equal to the third central moment is possible. And of course, eventually we came up use, using a neat proof, using Hermit polynomials, but it's not at all obvious. And when you go to higher order terms, for example, higher order central moments eh, expressed in terms of cumulants, now we have general formulae for these things, which are easy to write down in terms of iterated integrals, if, if you think about what this diamond product really represents. So now, actually, we could have got the same, we could have got the same expansion as the G expansion by considering a bivariate version of the K expansion. So let's consider that one. So instead of putting Z in there, we put A times Y plus B times quadratic variation of Y. And then you see, oh, we get the G expansion, but it's all jumbled. It's out of order. We've got mixtures of a we've got mixtures of trees with different number of leaves. If we reorder this expansion, so we see that this expansion is equivalent to the bivariate K recursion, reorder by collecting all trees with the same number of leaves, we get the G forest. And we see that the forest reordering resolves the infinite cancellations present in the bivariate K expansion. Because if we, we know that if we put B is equal to minus a half A squared, that all of these correction terms should disappear. And it's not at all obvious how they should disappear. Like you've got infinite number of cancellations going on here. When you write it out in G form, all the cancellations are immediate. Now let's apply this to finance, since this is supposedly the topic uh, that we're considering. And we consider a, a forward variant, um, a stochastic volatility model written in forward variance form. So V obviously is instantaneous variance and Xi, which is forward variance, is the time little t conditional expectation of instantaneous variance at some future time, big T. Forward variances are tradable assets. And, you know, this was a very nice idea of Bergomi and Guillon to put stochastic volatility models in this form. And one consequence, one's easy cor corollary of the G expansion is we can immediately get a, the triple, what we call the, the triple joint MGF. Well, what's in the MGF? We've got the final stock price or the final log stock price. We've got quadratic variation, and we've got final instantaneous variance. And it's written simply in this form, and you have these nice expressions 
G, uh, you just the same recursion as before. It's always the same recursion. And G2 is not too complicated looking. Now, it turns out to be useful to think in terms of colored leaves. We wrote G2 in diagrammatic form. G2 was given by two gray leaves that corresponds to X diamond X. And here we have X diamond zeta. Uh, and here we have zeta diamond zeta. Now we could have derived X, we could have defined X diamond X is equal to M. Uh, or in colors, we give this an orange color resulting in trees with leaves of three different colors. And in fact, we can always go into these diagrams, take any subtree and make that into, for example, this one here, color it, call it a new leaf of one color and reorder the expansion. This turns out to be pretty powerful and useful. So G2 ends up being this thing here. And then we get the F recursion from the G recursion. And we get back the result that I presented two years ago. But everything now is just reordered version of the cumulant expansion. So convergence, unlike two years ago, where we weren't really able to, we were able to indicate that we believed things should be convergent. Um, now we know exactly what the convergence properties are. And so now we define these F tilde forests, which are just exactly the same as the F forests, but with different indexing. And notice in particular that a, the, obviously when I stick A equals zero, all these trees vanish. That's the total probability condition. And when I stick A equal to minus I, they all vanish as well. So we have this nice um, um, property. Now, as we all know, the variance swap is given by the value of the log strip, and that ends up being this, and the gamma swap is given by that. So I'm just going to skip th through things that we did two years ago. And so we end up with a nice uh, expression for the leverage swap, uh, which in tree form looks very pretty, right? Because the leverage swap is basically the sum of all trees with only one M leaf. And you can see now the advantage of introducing a new colored leaf, it's easy to keep track of things, right? So we just throw out all trees with more than one M leaf and sum them all up. And this is now an explicit model-free expression for the leverage swap. And so I'm assuming that we're dealing with a model where these trees are really easy to compute or easy to approximate. Now, why is it interesting to have an, express, an explicit model-free expression for the leverage swap? Well, because we can get model-free expression of the leverage swap in terms of the volatility smile. So if you know of the volatility smile following Fukasawa, you can easily compute the variance swap and the gamma swap and so get the leverage swap. And since we have, if you think of S&P, there are like, let's say, 35 expirations today, that means you've got 35 a, values of the leverage swap each of which depends, let's say, on three parameters of some model or other, and so it's wildly overdetermined, and you can quickly calibrate your model. So in the case of the Rough Heston model, for example, you can calibrate your model in like a fraction of a microsecond, I would assume if you wrote the, in my case, I think my code runs in like a couple of microseconds. Now, a, you can also prove results about affine forward variance models in general. So this class of model includes classical and rough Heston. It was, uh, we defined this class of models, me and uh, Martin Keller Russell back in 2018, I guess, it published in 2019. And as we will see, diamond trees are very easy to compute in affine forward variance models. So we proved this theorem in uh, the paper all diamond trees take the following form for some function H. So for example, in the case of classical Heston, which has this forward variance form, then you get X diamond M is equal to that thing. And in the case of the rough Heston model, which by the way, is the one that is analytically most track, 
the most analytically tractable model, the one, at least the case with lambda equals zero, the most analytically tractable model, you get a beautiful expression for big psi. As you can see, it's just classical Heston with the exponential kernel replaced with a power law kernel. Then uh, M, which was this orange leaf, which if you remember represented X diamond X, is simply the variance swap and M diamond N, which it turns out is uh, the variance of the variance swap. So we see that uh, diamond trees with K leaves are of order this thing. So we can see basically it's a small time expansion. A, a has the interpretation of a small time expansion. And I know I'm running out of time here. So now we can write down um, the triple joint MGF in affine forward variance models by using that theorem I wrote down before. We can easily show that it has, that this triple joint MGF has this convolutional form. And that expression, which was really easy for us to derive, is a generalization of theorem 2.6 of our paper and also a theorem in uh, the paper of Abhi Jabber and Larson and those guys. Now, just as a final uh, sweet dessert, let me show you how quick things are to compute in the under rough Heston with lambda equals to zero. Well, dx is this. I ignore that term because remember, bounded variation terms don't contribute to the diamond product. And this is dm. Actually, I should probably have written another bounded variation term, but you anyway, you know what I mean. So x diamond m becomes this thing. And we see we're getting, we're starting to get integrals of this form. So it makes sense to define this kind of integral here. And then di of j ends up being that thing. It's an easy computation. And with this no notation, x diamond m is simply that. Forget m diamond m, but x diamond x diamond m, because we're thinking of doing the leverage swap at this point, ends up being this. And so all physicists are able to guess the pattern straight away. We easily see that x k times diamonded with m gives us this expression. So we can add them all up. And when we add them all up, we get the mid like left left function back out. So now in the rough Heston model with lambda equals zero, we have an explicit expression for the leverage swap, not just in principle explicit, but explicit explicit. And therefore, we can quickly calibrate the rough Heston model. So in summary, we introduce the diamond product. We define the G expansion, which is the daddy of the K expansion of Lacan, Rhodes, and Vargas, and our F expansion of Alos, Me, and uh, Radosh Radojic. And we showed how easy computations can be in affine forward variance models. And I hope I convinced you that the proof can is so simple that you can basically just remember this and show, show off at parties how you can write down the characteristic function for any model that anybody throws at you in close form. And here are some references. And with that, I'm happy to stop sharing and maybe take some questions. I'm not sure where I go to stop sharing. Here I go. Thank you very much, Jim. I think that's a very good ending to show off at parties with uh, the diamond expansion. And again, it's very, very good to see something that's explicit and intuitive here. Um, I'm looking at the questions um, in the chat, but, but again, leave to leave a little bit of time to people to uh, ask a question, perhaps. I don't see any at the moment, but Maybe just one, um, you mentioned in the beginning that you uh, start with the commutative case. Is there any hope to, to extend that to the non-commutative case and in case uh, like any motivation and hope would be nice? I think, I think there's great hope and it's kind of depressing for me, but fun for everybody else to know that no sooner had we finished this paper then Peter Fritz got one of his students to start working on the non-commutative case. 
and we see many, many beautiful things coming out, the Magnus expansion, many other things. And in fact, a, I believe there's a talk by one of his students on YouTube. Maybe I can post that later. I, and uh, well, it's this student who's working on it. I shouldn't say one of his students. It's this student who was amazingly fast and a guy called, I think he's Paul Haber. I think is his name, Paul Hager? Paul Hager, maybe, Paul Haber. Well, I'll find out. Anyway, he has a pretty, to me, pretty incomprehensible presentation, but to proper mathematicians, I'm sure, highly comprehensible. I think there are going to be huge developments on this front going forward. So I, I actually have two uh, questions here uh, that came up, and if we can answer them real quick, that would be great. So the first question comes from Julien Guillon, and he's asking if there's any chance uh, the expansion be computed in non-affine variance curve models as well? Well, so let's take uh, the roughware gomi model as an example. Uh, yes, the answer is yes. You can write down formal expressions for all these integrals and actually compute them. I have not found, well, I can compute x diamond m and m diamond m very fast. By the time I get to x diamond x diamond m, it starts to get slow. And by the time we get to x diamond x diamond x diamond m, it gets slower. But, you know, just need a good numerical analyst to make approximations to these things, I think. So definitely in that, those computations take advantage of the fact that the rothberg gomi model integrals are all Gaussian. So, it, but uh, yeah, more general models, who knows? But yeah, I take it as an implicit... Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I say that I, I take that as an as a as a yes. Um, last question: the connection on the Feynman diagrams. Maybe a very quick response to that, and then we are already almost well, at the end. It's just that they're trees, and uh, you know, it's just the fact that they're trees. Uh, yeah, with very simple rules. Okay. Then um, I think we have all questions answered. Thank you very much, Jim, and thank you very much, Roger. Uh, thanks to everyone in this session. I hope it was enjoyable, and uh, see you tomorrow again, I guess. Thank um, you so much, yes. Thank, thank you. you, see you tomorrow, and uh, good night, Bye. good morning, good afternoon good to night, everyone. Evening.